or want to get into uh, technology roles um, to support each other, learn from each other, help each other grow. Um, these circles are um, meetings where we uh, create a safe space where everyone can share information and feel comfortable to, to interact. Um, and we organize such um, get together, such events um, like the one we have today. Um, so um, feel free to, to look us up LinkedIn, um, on Facebook, on Meetup, you, you will find the community there and you can keep up to date with um, other upcoming events. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Lauren, who is going to be moderating today's event. Um, and I hope you will all enjoy it and find a lot of useful information from, um, from tonight's um, conversation. So, uh, Lauren, maybe you want to, to kick it off? Apologies, everybody. I was not a co-host, so I could not unmute myself. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Michaela and Stella, for that introduction. So excited to see so many people here today. Um, as mentioned, let's start with the agenda and a little bit of housekeeping. Um, today, we are going to be speaking to Gabriela, Melissa, and Pedro, who will be telling us about trends in, um, from an industry-wide perspective, from their own companies, and finally, some tips for all of you who are candidates and currently looking for jobs. We are going to have uh, some questions that we have pre-selected. The panel is going to speak about those. At the end, we're going to open it up to any questions that you have. Please put your questions in the chat. Feel free to put them in the chat as we're going along. Stella and Michaela will help me at the end to make sure that those questions get asked. Um, a little bit of housekeeping as well. Uh, feel free to use the chat as we're going along, but please make sure that the tone is respectful. Only private message people that you know or ask people for permission to private message them. If you have any issues throughout um, the event today, please approach um, one of the moderators and you can tell who they are because they also say lean in Portugal on their uh, profile photos. So um, let's get started. As I mentioned, uh, my name is Lauren. I work for an organization in, based here in Lisbon called HALA Systems. We create and deploy technologies that um, protect civilians before, during, and after conflict. Uh, I am HALA's recruitment manager, so I too have hired 40 people this last year. Uh, I think at the end, um, Michaela and Stella will give me a chance to maybe share some of my experience as well. But for now, let's go to the real experts on the panel and start with our first question, which is how has recruitment in the IT sector been impacted by our current situation? We're looking for both positive and negative. And I'll suggest for, for ease of, of conversation, let's start with some of the positives. Uh, Gabriela, Melissa, Pedro, feel free to unmute and whoever wants to go first, go for it. Okay, so Lauren, thank you so much for the intro. Uh, maybe oh, let I'm me so start sorry, Melissa, to interrupt. I forgot that you guys should introduce yourselves. So please introduce oh. <laughs> yourself and then answer the question. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. No, it's okay. So let me start by introducing myself because I was going to start by just a small intro to give you context because I work for a company that has been doing recruitment and hiring for a lot of different geographies in these last years. And so the effect that we've been feeling is not only in Portugal, but a bit worldwide. S starting with introducing myself and the company I work for. So I am Melissa and I work at OutSystems. OutSystems is a software company. We have our own products which is what we call a low-code platform. And the concept of low-code is really something that is uh, an alternative to traditional manual coding. It allows our clients to develop applications uh, with workflows, with drag and drop, and more visually making the development process a lot shorter and faster. I have been without systems for almost five years now. My entire career, I've always worked as an IT recruiter 
I worked for consultancy companies, I've worked for startups, I've worked for uh, call centers, so lots of different businesses. And in my five years at Out Systems, I have been hiring for technology across different uh, departments of the company and many different roles from UX, UI to project managers to developers. It's really been a mix. And thank you. And I think it's on to Gabrielle now. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Melissa. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, the both communities, Lean in Portugal and Women in Tech, for this invitation. And Mika Mihaela, Lauren, and Stella for uh, organizing all of this. It's great to be here. I'm Gabriela Tabolacci. I work as an IT recruiter for Boost IT now. Uh, it's a consultancy uh, for basically the tech industry uh, for specialized recruitment. We do outsourcing. Uh, direct hiring and nearshore projects. Uh, I have um, a background, especially in social communication, digital marketing agencies, which I've been uh, developing th throughout the years. And the last two years, I've been focusing on recruitment, uh, tech recruitment only. Uh, it's been very fun and very uh, interesting what has happened to the market, especially here in Europe. Yeah, this is basically it. I'll pass on to Pedro. Thank you, Gabriela, and thank you to the organization and Lauren for having us uh, here today. Uh, so basically, I'm Pedro and I work at Landing Jobs. Uh, Landing Jobs, for those who do not know, uh, is the biggest tech community in Portugal. Uh, if you have answered positively to, to the poll and you are looking for a job, uh, tech job in Portugal, I challenge you to, 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 to sign up and to find out the, the, the vacancies that we have there. We have 150 companies hiring for tech profiles, so uh, I'm sure you'll have a, a good time, hopefully. Um, as for myself, I am head of business in Portugal. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that I am responsible for the development and the, uh, the business development here in Portugal. Uh, the scope that I hope to bring to this discussion and to this conversation is definitely more on aggregate data. We do a lot of surveys and uh, market reports, both on the talent and uh, company side. And I hope that I can contribute with some uh, macro uh, guidelines uh, and so, yeah, that's it. Uh, I hope you all have a good time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you all of you for those introductions. So, um, in your opinion, how has recruitment in the IT sector been impacted by the times we're currently living in? So I think I think I can I can start, Lauren, and 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 let, let's let's start by saying that the IT set at least in Portugal has not been one of the one of the sectors that has been mostly affected but we do feel some changes in the market and in the candidates and something that we started feeling a lot and and I, I'm, I'm sorry but I'm going to start with the the challenges for us were that people feel a bit more afraid of changing so they are a bit more afraid of taking on a new job they are a bit holding on to their stability and they feel like they kind of need a new challenge i need to do something new but at the same time i am here i have a work contract i know what i can count with uh, i am going to jump into the unknown and so for, for us, we've seen candidates, especially in Portugal, a bit more afraid of changing and holding on to the safety that they already have. And what this means for us is that we need to do just a bigger effort to really convince these people to take the leap and that they will be good if they make the change. So it's it's also something that you have to do with the teams in the in, in the field. And that's actually one of the advantages of being an in-house recruiter. When the hiring managers like the candidate, they will do that push to talk with the candidate and help convince them. 
Uh, also, candidates want to negotiate offers more often because they also see the salary as safety uh, and taking the leap, they, they need to have better safety in their salary. So that is one of the adjustments that we, we've had to make in these last years. And once again, this is um, a bit Portugal specific in other geographies, for example, in the United States. I'm just talking about the United States because it's one of the geographies that I hire for a lot. There were lots of companies that did uh, layoffs. So we actually found more candidates available in the market. And the candidates that were still working, um, they were also very hesitant, but you also found people in the market that were just very qualified, but be, because of the, of the economy, they were affected and they had to leave their jobs. And so they were more eager to take a new job. Now, positives that were coming from all of this. We've become a lot more open to remote working. And this was something that in the past out systems was always very flexible, but you had people that did remote working like one day per week, two days per week, and you were always hiring people for your offices. So we have offices in Lisbon, in Braga, in Provença Nova, here in Portugal, you would not hire outside of these locations. Now, with everyone working from home, this really showed us that we can work remotely and we can collaborate remotely. So we started being more open to hiring people uh, in different geographies, even when we don't have an office there. And we actually have some teams that are saying, uh, hire the best person that you can find wherever you find them. Location is no longer important. So, so that is that has been really um, an upside of this. And I'm not sure if Gabriel or Pedro felt the same. Maybe, maybe you can share. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, so yes, and undoubtedly, uh, the current times, as, as the question was uh, uh, put out, uh, forced every business to, including the IT uh, recruitment sector, into changes to 100% now, right now, to remote flexibility and digital and virtual uh, interactivity at full power and full speed. So certainly there's some advantage on this on both ends, such as for professionals, such as in, uh, in businesses. And the challenge here is the fast adaptation to this, of course. Uh, the positive point, which Lauren asked for us, I believe is, as uh, Melissa was saying, the uh, borders free almost opportunity. So raising the uh, technology, uh, uh, the technical knowledge of uh, as top priority among other uh, any other profile aspects. So meaning diversity and inclusion will be erased naturally with this. Um, first of all, the remote was implied as a as a health. Um, sensitivity issue but now uh, we also see cost effectiveness and uh, this brings work uh, workers life balance and also practical business uh, advantage so i i guess this is a a thing uh, to stay actually and very positive so uh, as far I think a lot uh, as in said already, uh, but uh, definitely I mean we are using more technology today than we were probably one year ago, right? So uh, to some extent, uh, I mean of course tech recruitment in the end was probably overall aggregate, aggregately speaking uh, boosted by, by, by the growth of uh, software as a service products, uh, digital products and so on and so forth. So yes, it's definitely a very lucky sector when we look around and we look to probably other industries who, which are very, very uh, armed by, by, by the pandemic. What we see is that yes, I mean, the first response was very critical, I remember if we look back to April, we had companies uh, laying off people, we had uh, um, companies and industries really struggling. We know travel, hospitality, uh, and so on and so forth. But even now, if you look at these companies, they are uh, back on their feet. Uh, and I, I remember there were a lot of articles back then saying how, yes, now the market is leveled. Now there is a balance in the market. Um, candidates uh, are 
and now have to lower their 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 salary expectations they must uh, be back to the game and tech recruitment is now uh, easier when actually the the reports by both Gabrielle and Melissa are exactly what we felt which isn't that isn't the case at all uh, today candidates might actually have more power uh, than they had before because actually and I might compare this to to some extent the oil prices and maybe candidates are holding back <laughs> and the fact that they're holding back is creating a massive gap uh, in the market and the huge need by companies to to fill in uh, these these vacancies when it comes to data and trying to give a bit of an insight on the report we are carrying out and which we will launch soon uh, only 33 percent of the companies we made a report to over 200 companies uh hiring tech people in portugal uh, and only one third of them reported the negative impact of the pandemic in their recruitment the recruitment. This doesn't mean, however, that the job got easier because actually most of them, 61%, said it became harder to recruit. So overall, uh, you have to recruit more, but you have to run twice as fast or to source twice as much to find the, the, the right candidate. Uh, and definitely um, on the good side, uh, some companies took the the if you allow me to be this, uh, this assertive, the, the right way, which is exactly, we are all remote. So let's hire the best candidates wherever they are. Uh, and so they are being able to somehow uh, overcome uh, this challenge by opening and widening their talent pools. However, we have a lot of companies who are still uh, in denial to some extent expecting uh, an end to this uh, season pandemic season um, and definitely this will uh, come back to want them however just to introduce a final challenge and how the recruitment in the IT sector uh, might be impact negatively on the long run is I mean yes companies in Portugal are recruiting all over the world but so are companies in the US, in the UK, in markets where the, the, the salary levels are higher. And so it definitely brings some pressure uh, to, the, to the salary wars uh, in Portugal. And this is definitely a trend that uh, might be here to stay. And so we need to understand uh, how companies from all around the globe will compete for global talent when living costs are obviously uh, very different in different locations. Yes, thank you, Peter, because I, I also felt the same with some candidates that we were talking, <laughs> that they got offers from companies that are not located in Portugal, uh, foreign companies in the US and the UK that hire people in Portugal with salaries that are much more competitive than, than the Portuguese market usually offers. And this is mm -hmm. huge opportunity for candidates and big challenge for, for Portuguese companies. Understood. Um, I do have a question, a follow-up question to that. Um, Melissa, yeah. it made sense to me when you said that your company was hiring uh, for Braga within Braga and now you could hire somebody in Lisbon to work at the, at the Braga location because the location is not important. But are you all also finding that there is an increase in the number of full-time and, and full-time contracting offers that you're making? Because my understanding is that it's, it's without creating a company in each country where you have a worker, you cannot employ them as an employee. So how is this working? And is this a, a trend that you're seeing as well? Because I, I think that the law and the, in, my, in my understanding, the law really hasn't caught up with how this is all going to work. Uh, a contractor should not be full-time, that's an employee. But if we're going to be free uh, to work remotely, how, how is that being balanced by each of your organizations? Lauren, th thank you for the question. Uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, and, 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 I, and I am laughing because I know that <laughs> Boost IT and Landing Jobs are some of the partners that help us solve yeah. part of that question. And so there are two different things here. Um, for, for people that are based in Portugal, we can just make them a work contract. For people that are based in, a, in other locations, uh, we, we, we actually have offices in a lot of locations. So in the offices where, the, where we have out systems as a legal entity, we employ the candidate directly. In countries where we don't have a legal entity, 
we can work with uh, a third party uh, to help us contract that person for us. And so one of the one of the solutions that we can use is something like like landing jobs, and we actually work a lot with them to to help us bring and onboard the these foreign can, candidates in locations where we don't have a legal entity. So one of the functions of landing jobs is as a professional employment organization, a PEO. We we want to help companies hiring the, the best talent in Portugal. And so sometimes that means while they are not able to build an entity in Portugal, for example, to act as an employer of record, uh, uh, because otherwise maybe the company will not employ people today. They might or go to some other country or, you know, uh, just uh, delay the, 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 the employment opportunity. So yes, we provide this and we also try to facilitate the interaction with international candidates uh, in countries where we are not, but in this case as a contracting, uh, uh, in a contracting scheme. Yes, yes. Sorry. sorry, Gabriel, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to, comp uh, to, to complement the, the information. Yes, yeah, same as Boost IT, we also do nearshore projects for uh, foreigner companies which want to act within Portugal's market. Uh, or European market uh, that we also do partners with the uh, OutSystems. That's, so this is more or less uh, one of our um, services. And have you, so you have found an increase in the need for these services over the last year? Yes. And, and one, of, one of the challenges that we have is that we also hire people outside of Portugal to come and work in Portugal. For example, we were doing a lot of that with Brazil, but when the pandemic started, it was just absolutely impossible to to get the 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 the, uh, the bureaucracy going, and people were just stuck wanting to come to Portugal and work. Uh, they had already quit their jobs and they couldn't come and work for Portugal. And so the, these kind of companies also help us um, ha have the employee working with us until they can have uh, legally a work contract with us. Very interesting. So it sort of sounds like all three of you are saying that you think that particular trend is going to stick around. Um, any other trends that you mentioned that you think are here to stay? <laughs> so I, I, am, I am reading one of, one of the comments on the chat and, and this, this actually rings true to something that we are feeling that remote working is here to, to stay to a certain extent. Uh, this doesn't mean that all companies will be full remote, but a lot more flexibility for workers to be able to decide when they want to work from the office or when they want to work from home and more seeing the offices as spaces for collaboration and working together instead of a place where you have to go and sit every day, every single day of the week for eight hours to, to get the work done. So you can work from your house, you can work from a cafe, where, wherever you just feel comfortable and use the, the office space to, to be with others and have meetings and, and see your colleagues and bond with your colleagues instead of only, only, only working. So I would say something that we, we've learned and that is here to stay is that work doesn't only need to happen in the workplace or during the work hours. Because working from home, you also find the flexibility to, um, you're gonna start your day later because you start the day taking care of private things that you need to take care of. And you're gonna finish later in the day because you feel more comfortable doing that. You are more productive in the evening. You, you, ju you just manage the way, the way that, you, that you want. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, remote flexible is here to stay is exactly that um, it's something that brings balance both to the company and to to the professional it's a business advantage on both sides for sure i will uh, just uh, add uh, besides the the salary point that i made earlier which i think is something that's easier to stay as companies start going more and more uh, remote so will uh, international recruitment and so will the challenge of global salaries. 
Uh, number two, definitely remote working. I mean, I also I agree with Melissa. I don't believe full remote will become the norm. Uh, I think there are a number of studies uh, that are showing that people, there's not a majority of uh, people uh, wanting to go 100% remote, not at all. Uh, there's definitely a, a mix here to, to be made. And there's some, and I, I mean, out of all times, of course, now we are really missing the office. We always miss what we don't have. So at the right. moment, we are definitely, definitely missing the office. Uh, and then number three, I would say, and this, I mean, not something that is here to stay, uh, but definitely for the next, while there is uh, economic uncertainty and while there is uh, questions about how will, uh, how well will the economy, will this company be in the next uh, two years, as long as this lasts, the kind of issues that Melissa was raising regarding uh, salaries and stability will definitely be an issue. Current employer, this is an opportunity for current employers. So, I mean, if they are able to, and we are seeing this a lot, uh, if you are able to match an offer that your employee has, I mean, uh, the safety uh, that your employee has in your organization and the acquired rights that they have under the, the labor law are, quite good and a good match to against moving to, to, to a new company. So, yeah. Understood. Have you three seen changes in the types of roles that are in demand over the last year? Yeah, Gabriela, go ahead. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Uh, niche fields uh, such as infrastructure, software development, cybersecurity, data field, all of these, uh, let's say, pillars supporting the whole IT operation is definitely uh, thriving now a days. Uh, emerging technologies uh, such as I IoT, uh, robot process automation. Um, they call also uh, everything as a service. Also, um, these emerging technologies are here to stay and they're just getting started. So these are kind of the roles that are blooming, let's say, nowadays. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Gabriel. I think uh, security also, I've seen a lot, uh, quite a rise in, uh, uh, in DevOps as well. I think with the increasing usage of some platforms, there has also been an increase in the need for talent that is able to, to make them run uh, effectively. Um, and yes, I mean, then, of course, the, the usual suspects, the, as Gabriel said, there are some profiles that just aren't there yet in terms of in the market. So, of course, we have uh, IO mobile development as a whole is a, is a issue. And in the end, seniority. I mean, uh, I don't think it's pretty much a sort of, I don't think the need, of course, there are these kind of profiles which are niche profiles, but then it's a matter of seniority and companies uh, really requiring uh, solid uh, people for their team, maybe because uh, Working remotely, uh, you, the companies do not have that much availability to train and to uh, follow and onboard uh, an experienced uh, people. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I agree with Pedro and Gabriel. That, that's what we've also felt. Have any of you uh, noticed any industry-wide, when we're talking about these changes that we think are here to stay, we're talking about this concept, for example, flexibility, um, being able to go, uh, thinking about the workspace in a different way. Um, but I'm wondering if there's anything else uh, to push on that a little bit further that you see as a change in the way in which your company has begun to operate as a result of being more remote friendly. Uh, earlier, one of, and apologies, I don't remember who it was, one of you mentioned that uh, there was this uh, idea of, of being full force in uh, helping employees get to know each other or to have a relationship from a remote perspective. So I'm curious, how, how have you done that in your companies? Uh, how are you creating company culture when none of you can be in the same room together? And which aspects that you've implemented do you think are here to stay in that remote hybrid model? That's, that's, that's a good question, Lauren. Uh, and something that we felt 
we, with the, the growth of the remote work was that we started having more geographically distributed teams. And uh, what this means is that you can have a team where some people are in Portugal, some people are in the United States, the others are in Germany. And so you, you have a team that has not have had the chance to, to meet face to face. You, you have a lot of team members that were onboarded remotely uh, and, and you just have a different level of collaboration. And this is really an, an ongoing challenge. Um, and, and, and part of it comes from the employee itself. When you, when you start working and you are remote from the beginning, you need to be a lot more proactive to go after the rest of the team, to try to talk with people, to ask questions, because we had some people that were onboarded, but they were shy. They didn't want to talk, so they were just doing their work on their own and they were doing wrong things. And you don't have like the, the coffee that happens spontaneously. You don't have a colleague sitting next to you. And so people need to be comfortable with pushing these kinds of interactions. And the managers themselves, they need to be a lot more present for, for, for the employee and with the onboarding. For example, and this was something that we implemented in my team, but every every morning uh, we we have a, a slot which is a 30 minute meeting. Initially, it was supposed to be to talk about work, but we never talked about work. It's basically our coffee. And we just go in and we talk about, usually not about work, it's just our moment to relax and laugh and be together. And this is something that really helps keep that interaction with the team. And, and so helping teams find these moments and helping teams organize remote events. We actually got a lot of requests from teams to help them organize uh, remote interactions and remote events with each other. This is really important to help people um, mingle and have a connection when they are working remotely. I, I see Gabrielle is, is nodding her head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, uh, the work-life balance that um, the, the remote flexibility uh, provides to us also comes this responsibility on not only virtualizing our work process, but also virtualizing our social uh, virtual interaction. So, um, so yeah, this is a very important topic that uh, let's say the more senior generations or the mo most older generations and or the, the departments uh, that take care of this uh, have to really pay attention on this. This will be a very important subject to not uh, of us losing our human uh, touch and our human interactions for sure. So this is a very sensitive and important topic for sure. Uh, I'll be very, very transparent. I mean, landing jobs at a very office oriented uh, culture. And so it was definitely uh, art culture wise to, 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 to make the shift and to, to answer. I mean, of course, you, you do the, the, the online beers and you do the, the, the weekly coffees and the weekly hangouts. But it just doesn't feel the same, right? I mean, it's, you can't uh, exchange. Uh, physical routines for uh, for for remote routines and expect the results over the long term to to be the same um what we started doing was definitely i mean as melissa said for example in my team i i use exactly the same strategy creating a, a daily time a, a water cooler you you call it um in which the team gets to just uh be together. I mean, there's no really an agenda. Of course, if there are questions uh, to to be made, like the kind of questions that would make you just stand up, go to your colleague and ask that question, you can. Uh, you should be able to ask there. Uh, and then, I mean, you have a lot of um, of tools that try to create this serendipity, so to say, that uh, that you cannot have in the um, in the uh, working online. I'll only also raise the point of the work-life balance. It works to some extent. I mean, of course, we are spending way less time uh, commuting. We are working, we are being able to do, to, to put things together that we didn't before. At the same time, it's also it's also more draining to, to some people to, to manage the, the work-life 
and to manage this work-life balance in the end, because it's like you have, uh, with the schools closed, you have uh, two kids uh, at home and you have to both work and uh, take care of them, ensure that they are on class, Wi-Fi issues, I mean, uh, that's that's a given. Uh, I came to the office because I, I can't rely uh, on my my home Wi-Fi, so uh, and so I mean that's the. This also raises some 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 issues and challenges, definitely. Agreed. I, I mean, I think we can all agree that anybody who's had small kids at home during the pandemic uh, has made a valiant effort, but is probably not been able to be as productive as they have had wished. I do think that it, it, there is a possibility of it creating better work-life balance once the kids are back in school. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if the three of you, if this has been discussed at your companies, uh, one thing that uh, I read about happening in the States, is, in the United States, is people starting to talk about right to leave work policies. Um, in other words, really forcing employees to not be able to log on to their systems after 7 p.m. Uh, or making some sort of boundary because it turns out we're all stuck at home without these boundaries. So have you, have you, the three of you seen any human resource policies that are related to this within your own companies in trying to, uh, let's say, create a culture of having a good work-life balance? Actually, Lauren, I've heard about the same you, you've heard, but in, in France, because I, I believe there were even some legal processes surround, surrounding that. We, we never discussed that at out systems. Uh, we, we go with the flexibility and that people are uh, mature enough to manage their time and, and their responsibilities. Of course, that it's more challenging when you have kids in the house uh, and, and, the, and the demands are different, uh, but, but it's really um, up for employees to decide how they want to manage their time. And managers here act as supporters for, for the employees. And, and, this, and this is something, this is actually a very delicate balance, and especially because a lot of teams here in, here in out systems work in people that are in other time zones. We work a lot with the United States, especially our engineering teams. And so the United States, uh, they are five, eight hours behind us. <laughs> and so you need to, to make that adjustment and decide how you want to manage your day. But for example, if you know that you are going to, to collaborate with someone who is five hours um, behind you. Maybe you are going to start your day later because you don't have so much to do the, in, the, in those days. And so you have that as private time. And during the afternoon, that's where you need to, to work and you, and you finish your work later to keep that collaboration. But it, it's really a balance for people to take. It's not, it's not something that, to, that we've talked about formalizing as a policy. Yeah, likewise here at Boost IT, we have, uh, we give the liberty for each individual to um, balance their life and their, their, their personal life with work. So if they need a, a, a certain time to, 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 to leave or to adjust for their family needs or for any kind of needs, this is agreed between, a, let's say, manager or with the, with the, um, with the responsible and that's a total totally flex flexible and adjustable within the company. That's pretty okay. And we have adapt that for, adopt that for a, quite a while now. But of course it makes sense uh, when we're talking about a global scale, uh, something corporate to happen. Uh, I, I guess that makes sense. And that it looks like it's coming up for the future for sure. I would say that I, I see the good intention in that, uh... In that policy uh, but I mean in the end uh, no in landing jobs we we haven't done that we I mean actually part of our vision is that people should have ownership of those careers and so being forced to work from nine to seven will be quite uh, uh, quite contradictory contradictory to to this to this vision uh, I mean uh, in the end uh, you should be able to work after seven if you want to I mean maybe I want to or I need to take two hours to take care of uh, I don't know some personal issue and then I want to to to, to make up for that uh, later so I mean I think um, companies shouldn't try to 
to go for the easy uh, easy fix, uh, draconian to some extent as well, uh, because most of the times it will produce more 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 harm than, than good. I, I tend to agree. I think treating people like adults is always a good idea. Uh, default default to a position of trust, I think, is is really one of the ways to go. Um, I'm I don't have the chat open, so I'm actually not sure uh, how many people took the poll and and how many of you on the call today are looking for a job. But I thought maybe we could switch gears a little bit at this stage and ask our three panelists to tell us about. Um, skills that they're looking for specifically from candidates and how has the act of recruitment changed recruiting itself? Um, I know one of the obvious ones is that all interviews are remote now and you're not getting a tour of the office. So uh, I wanna start first from the recruiter perspective. How do the three of you feel that you've had to change the way that you evaluate somebody um, and then we can circle back to the additional skills you're looking from the candidates. Gabriela, go ahead. I'm just yeah. gonna, you're, on, right. you're already unmuted. So go ahead, please. Okay, okay, thanks. So um, I can tell you that being very clear here, niche specialization will be key. Let's say it's a key now, it's, it's what's the most important. But in these times of deep changes of, full professional uh, virtual interaction, the soft skills are tremendously important. Um, being capable of balancing uh, the productivity and managing everything you we had even before COVID, uh, like presentation, your speech, your timing, but now in an agile pace and of course fully um, digital will be more uh, seriously taken in consideration. So let's say bottom line, uh, more sharp um, vid uh, virtual uh, preparation and productivity ready. Okay, so uh, being thoughtful of your behavior, of your speech, of your gestures, everything counts beyond also, also beyond your uh, tech um, skills and the way that of course you're able to communicate and of course successively balance this uh, all over uh, um, in an overall with your personal life as we were just saying. Thank you, Gabriel. Lauren, let me just start by adding that the change in the recruitment process to become remote for us was a big, big change because we had some candidates for for some for some roles that we were actually inviting the candidates to come to the office some candidates were even coming from other countries and we were inviting them to be in the office because we wanted to have that face-to-face -face interaction with the person before we hire them and nowadays um, traveling is is barely an option even if you really wanted to and so the teams had to to have this huge mindset change to be able to accept that they're not going to meet the person face to face to to hire them and to become more mindful of the person's communication because you, you make a big, big effort to read the non-verbal language and you need to be able to pick up some signs. For example, if the candidate, if you're asking uh, questions and the candidate he seems to be reading the screen, um, you welcome uh, distractions, the kids, the, the dogs are gonna be on the calls and you need to see this as um, amusing, even though it can be very very irritating. So you had to make that big, big adjustment. And then in terms of the profile, I think it's just Gabrielle said it all. People need to be really mature to be able to, to deal with the remote context uh, and be able to go after information, to ask questions, to try to catch up with their teams, uh, to, to communicate more and the candidate themselves need to make that that adjustment and we need to look for people that are going to be able to be very remote because sometimes uh, they're just going to be in front of their laptop and people aren't answering and they have an urgent problem they need to solve and they need to figure it out so I wouldn't I wouldn't add anything from what Gabriel said here so uh not meaning to to repeat i'll probably 
I like the three points, yes, autonomy. I mean, you will have to be more autonomous and to uh, be more proactive uh, in your uh, process. You need to show the, the recruiter, the hiring manager, that um, you will be able to ask one thing once probably and then uh, do it yourself. You'll have less day-to-day uh, -day coaching, so you need to show uh, more assertiveness and autonomy on this regard, resourcefulness as well, as Melissa was saying now. Uh, I mean, the, the way that you are able to find the information and to uh, get around it. Um, and also something that I think Gabriela mentioned as well, uh, effective communication. I mean, once again, we are writing a lot more, we are communicating a lot more via Slack teams to pick your poison, uh, and so it's it's important that uh, that you show uh, conciseness uh, also, and you are able to say things straight ahead. Uh, communicating asynchronously, sometimes you find people that uh, still today they send you a message saying, "Hi there, how are you?" and then they don't, they just stop there and they wait for you to to. To, to all's good, what about you, to ask the, the right question. And I mean, you just have to, to assume that the person will answer uh, when, uh, when possible. When it comes to the interviews, you mentioned this as well, Lauren, virtual versus real life. I think uh, this was mentioned already. I, the control is less on the candidate side, right? I mean, before, yes, we would have to go to an office or somewhere to take an interview. Now we don't. We can take it uh, at home. At the same time, I mean, we don't control our environment. We don't control whether our Wi-Fi will decide to surprise us during that uh, those 45 minutes. We don't know if the dog will start will start barking if uh, an order an online uh, order will arrive uh, during the, the the interview uh and i mean of course uh, we have a lot of recruiters and i think we should all take an effort to acknowledge this is normal at the moment and people uh must be able to to address some of these uh, some of these uh, problems um at the same time of course it creates anxiety and it also even if subconsciously it's difficult for me to have a smoothless uh interview uh then an interview which was interrupted three times i could barely listen to the person and so this might uh, create some challenges for candidates at the same time it opens windows for scheduling right i mean before maybe scheduling at i don't know during the day would be a problem now maybe we can manage scheduling at 9 a.m or 8 a.m will probably be uh, going to work and now we can have an interview so not all is bad <laughs> no agreed i think we can we can all agree that one of the themes here is flexibility i'm curious to know if prior to the pandemic when you were doing in-person interviews uh if your um Internal policies was was to. Uh, I'm trying to think of how to how to phrase this properly. I think uh, I'm speaking from my own experience of having, for example, people show up in their pajamas for interviews, which I find an interesting choice. Um, I know that we're very flexible and relaxed, but I can't imagine somebody showing up at my office in their pajamas, um, or, you know, sitting in bed with all the pillows behind them. And so I'm just wondering if on a very basic level in terms of appearance on a video call, do you any have any suggestions for candidates to be able to get a step up over other candidates? We can all agree not no pajamas, but any other tips? Melissa? Yes, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one, Lauren. So we, we're actually not very, Picky, I would say. OutSystems is a very laid back company, so you don't need to wear any formal attire. Um, I have some concern about what you have uh, behind you. Super messy rooms are not the best approach. And you and I, actually I am using my 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 Zoom background because I am in the kitchen and you don't want to see my kitchen the way it looks right now. So try to try to use the backgrounds. Uh, 
uh, dress okay. You don't need to be formal for, for out systems. You don't need to be if you are going to talk with a bit of more formal institution, maybe care a bit more about what you are wearing. Uh, and the really, really tricky part is uh, avoiding avoiding distractions. Uh, try not to be uh, multitasking while you are doing an interview because you are going to get a bit confused and and it's it's really hard because you sometimes you have a lot of things to do and you are doing the interview and answering an email or talking with someone but you just appear distracted uh, and that's not good so those would be my suggestions i'm sure that gabriel and pedro will have other experiences yeah uh Absolutely. Uh, as we are a consultancy, we, we see we have all types of industry and all types of projects. So we have since uh, banks, uh, since uh, technology. It, it, well, so we, we also have to have this adjustment to, to the industries, let's say culture, therefore dress code. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, what we are passing through the image will also can symbolize and reflect our, uh, or can be projected on our own selves. For example, a messy room can also, uh, this person as a first contact, of course, can project as a messy person or a messy professional. So minimizing all of these risks will be uh, a benefit, uh, will be an advantage for the professional to only concentrate on their on their skills and what actually matters to the interview. Uh, as for me, my quick bullets will, will definitely be, uh, I mean, of course, dress for the job as you would physically. If you wouldn't interview in pajamas before, don't interview in pajamas today. Uh, also, I would say, uh, be careful with the background. Definitely, you don't want like, the attention to be behind you, uh, and I'm I'm actually risking it at the moment. Uh, and um, also, I mean, mind the angle. I mean, don't it wouldn't be okay if I would be interviewing like this, or if this would be pointing at me like this. I mean, try to face the camera, uh, look at the camera, and uh, keep it this way to have a conversation. As Melissa said, avoid like. It's very easy to understand when someone is uh, distracted, exactly, uh, either doing something very useful or something uh, not that useful. We can't say that's the problem. Uh, so try to keep your eyes on the camera, uh, keep yourself centered, and the focus should be you and what you're saying and not the background, what you're wearing or uh, whatever. Thank you. I'm also curious as a follow-up to that, if any of your, the companies that you work for have changed the way in which the number of interviews that they're giving to people. Uh, I think a lot of us are used to situations where you go into the office and you talk to four people in a two hour block. Um, has that now transferred to four people interviewing you uh, on a Zoom call or are those now spread out one by one, uh, thus increasing the recruitment process? So. What have the three of you observed in terms of the length of time that it takes to hire somebody or the changes in the number of interviews that you're scheduling people for? Sorry, I'm sorry, I, I keep forgetting to call on you guys. <laughs> feel free, yes, feel free, guys. <laughs> feel free. I can, I can go. Um, so ac actually at Health Systems, we, last year was a really good year to do the, the work of trying to streamline our recruitment process because we've had different practices across the organization. So what we've been advocating for and trying to make everyone follow is a recruitment process with four interviews. So one with the recruitment, one with the technical team, one exercise, and, and in some areas, um, the director or the VP of the area wants to, to get to know the candidate. And so it's been a, a really good year where we were able to implement that for a lot of the areas. 
So we, I would say that we actually had the other tendency. We have uh, a shorter recruitment process with a big emphasis on the on the exercise, the practical exercise, and the, the exercise must be done in interaction with the candidate, not only to gather the answers, but to understand how the person is thinking, how they structure their thinking, and how they arrive to, to the answer, as opposite to people doing a test at home that you don't know how they are going to, to do the test and if they do it with help or not. Well, uh, well, we really care about user experience. So we try uh, at best to adjust for any project that we have that the professional passes through a good experience, whatever uh, the, the, the end line is. Um, and we try to, to always instruct this professional who he's going to talk to, who is he going to talk to, how is it going to be, and uh, to have this experience as a, as a good experience uh, in totality. Um, but each process, each project has their own process. Sometimes we have to apply a technical tests even before going to interview. Sometimes it's after going to interview. There's much many different ways of processes. But yes, we're always open to not only interviewing for determined um, profiles for determined opportunity, but also proactively uh, getting to know people as they have uh, uh, a specialization or, or a motive to, to, to work. Yeah, we're always uh, free on that and always work, uh, thinking on the user experience for sure. In landing jobs, I mean, we are fortunate and unfortunate to see a lot of everything. I mean, we have seen companies who would not they will migrate the whole process online, but the day in our office must be on site. And so uh, this resulted in also, but then they couldn't, they would either lose the candidates in that step because, well, uh, no one's that interested in, in going to a day in an office with people they don't yet know uh, at the moment. Uh, and sometimes they will just wait, you know, like in, in May, for example, when you're like, it's getting to the end, but it's not yet over. So in these sorts of times, they'll just delay, 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 delay the processes. And the problem with delaying the processes, yes, it's a problem on the candidate side, but on the company side, I mean, you are giving more time to your competitors to get there, start the process, finish the process, and uh, hire the person before you, you made a move. Um, I would say that the good examples did exactly what you were saying, Lauren, which is they they adapted the current process into uh, uh, going online, uh, basically. So if they had a day in the office, they would ask four to five people of different teams to be in a Zoom call of about maybe one hour. It wouldn't be a day, yes, it would be an hour to hour structure with a, a certain script. And, uh, and they saved time, right? I mean, uh, uh, in the end, instead of a day, they are spending two hours uh, instead of asking the candidate for one day of availability, which was also an issue with these sort of uh, steps. It's very easy to ask a candidate to spend a day in our office, but okay, so is he or she supposed to go on a weekend, uh, take a day off to be able to perform the, the, the step? So, uh, in the end, companies adapted, and uh, at the moment, that's that's the way to go. Great, thank you. Um, I think since it's six o'clock, we have thirty minutes left. Why don't we move on to some of the questions from the chat? Sure. Um, I can I can jump in here quickly. Uh, while you were talking and discussing all these amazing topics, there was an ongoing conversation in the chat um, and a lot of people asking many questions. Um, I can start with one. Um, not sure we will have the time to cover all the questions, but we will try to do our best to cover three or four of them. Um, in terms of uh, roles and positions, you were talking um, about being the surgeon looking for um, specialist roles and niche positions. 
Um, how have uh, roles for more general tech capabilities like strategy consultants, um, products, business consulting, um, so ger generic software engineering, um, how have these roles changed and the requirements for these roles changed over time? Uh, can I go, guys? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, it's all about uh, bringing up to spotlight the technical, uh, technological um, and tactical assets. Okay, so even if you know gener generic, let's say technology, it's all about how you expose your ways of working and how will that aggregate, how would that add to the company, to the project? So uh, being clear on your objectives, on your, your, your projects um, is, is also key here uh, once you have a more, as you were saying, a generic um, uh, title or generic um, uh, role. It's how you, how can you add? How can you bring, what, what can you bring to the company? How are you gonna do that? That's basically in, in, a, in a simplified way, that's how I would put it. I would add maybe that, I mean, yes, it's been so, sorry, sorry, Lauren, go ahead. Pedro, no, no, before you jump in, just a follow up to that. Do you feel like though, though that category of jobs has also uh, that there's been a boom in that particular category of jobs? So the non niche. Uh, could you be more sp uh, specific? Uh, um, what kind of? Uh, if I can, yes, so, I can go now go ahead. because I'll actually, and then Gabriella probably can can, sure. can complement. Uh, because I mean, yes, we spent a, some time talking about security and mobile. It's, I mean, these are these are the ones that grew the most. But let's be clear, these are not the the bulk of the market, not at all. I mean, when it comes to to the stock of jobs, for example, in, in landing jobs or even in LinkedIn, I mean, I, I don't think we're far off the market. Uh, development is uh, definitely one of the most sought after positions, full stack, front end, back end. I mean, depends on the type of company, of course, but those are still the the the, the big chunk, the 80%, not 80 maybe, but a big part of the market. And then you have the long tail, yes, where you have the kind of profiles that we were referring security, uh, mobile DevOps, etc., which are rising, yes, but I mean, they're also rising from a, it's easy to grow 100% if you have one, right? Uh, you only need another one. While if you have uh, 500 jobs, you need to, to grow a lot more uh, for the same relative uh, growth. When it comes to consultants, I mean, I'm sure uh, in landing jobs, we don't have as many of uh, those positions. Uh, but I'm sure the, 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 these followed the, the market trends, the thing with consultants, uh, but Gabrielle is the expert here, so she can probably answer as best, is that yes, in, the, in April, when the, the boom, when the big hits uh, happened, like many other companies, not only consultancies, uh, there was a, a, a shock in the demand for consultants because out of a sudden you have clients canceling uh, projects and you had a lot of people uh, to, 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 to handle. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if I can add, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want to speak, Melissa? Yeah, okay. Well, um, yeah, the, the thing is that what I've been reading also is what we, what we all have been reading is that um, everything that is more generalistic, I, I don't know if that's the right term here, but will be soon, if, if not now, will be soon uh, automatized so, uh, or exchanged by robots. So everything that we can add, um, that we can become a difference within the project, within a business, within any type of um, circle here, that will be the add value for sure. So this is more of the mindset what I'm trying to, to, to put in here. Sure. No, no. And I, I, I completely agree and understand. I think the question from the chat was sort of more related to uh, tech adjacent capacities. So product innovation, business consulting, technology mm -hmm. assessment type roles um, that I, I think if your companies are, are like mine, we want people who have previous experience doing business development at a technology company because our problems are going to be specific to, to technology and being able to at least 
uh, have a fundamental understanding of how our technology works is very important and being able to execute a function that isn't necessarily a technology function. Um, and so yeah. have you seen an increase in those types of jobs as well? Okay, it's because I'm a, um, a IT recruiter. So I've been mostly working with IT related uh, roles. But, um, but yeah, um, this, I don't, I don't know if I can fully answer that question. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's is... okay. Yeah, I think I, I think I can uh, add from my experience at OutSystems, and because OutSystems is a product company, there are a lot of activities related to selling the product and managing customers and managing projects for customers. So the technology side and the development, cloud, etc., it's a big chunk of the company, but there are lots of other roles, and. Actually, 2020 has been a, a year of lots of growth for our systems. And, and, and when the business grows, you, you need to grow everything that is around it. So we actually felt the need to hire more people for sales functions, uh, for product management. We started hiring um, a lot of product owners too. So still technology, but not uh, ne necessarily uh, development people, uh, people to help us with finance, with marketing. So we actually saw a growth in the hiring of some of these roles that were just uh, moving along with the, with the expansion of the rest of the company. But this is just the example from out systems. I, I cannot speak for the entire market. I wish I could, but in these positions, uh, as Gabriella said, I I don't think we we can add much to to the discussion. But I would bet, in terms of uh, the overall view, that they will follow the market. I mean, they are not the first positions that a company uh, will put out. Uh, they will first probably build the product, build the solution, and then uh, get the the team to back it up, like any product, right? I mean, usually the the growth of a company is founders development and sales, right? And adjacent, uh, adjacent positions. So I would say that uh, they will rise when the, after the, the big chunk of the tech market uh, is done. Thank you. Another question from the chat is, how do you see the increasingly international workforce in Portugal influencing the rec influencing recruiting processes in the future? Um, the person who's asking the question was saying that she thinks language, uh, in addition to salary, will be one of the key topics um, as we become more international and location is not so relevant anymore. Any opinions on, on that? Um, well, definitely. I didn't quite understand. Yeah, I mean, that was already uh, uh, insightful uh, information, right? Yeah, I totally agree. It, it looks like we're more, as I was saying on our, our first question, uh, it's almost like, it, it feels like almost like a border free uh, uh, environment. And yeah, we have to all, it, it's good. It's, it's, a, it's an advantage, all of us speaking the same language and, and uh, being able to communicate with, uh, with each other. That's definitely very good, a positive um, point there. On the language topic, uh, I mean, I think we are increasingly going for uh, in global workplaces, and this means at the moment uh, English speaking uh, uh, workplaces. I mean, I think there it is already uh, quite uh, common in I wouldn't say most because I think we are all we also tend to put ourselves in this bubble and only uh, consider the, the companies around us, but there's definitely a considerable amount of companies already uh, using English as the, the, the working language. When it comes to salary, I mean, it's really, really, it will be a famous last words moment. I mean, we can't really predict at the moment what, uh, what is going to happen. I mean, you have companies trying to address this by paying different, adjusting the salary to the to the living costs. You have a lot of companies who are doing this. They have like the San Francisco, the GitLab, for example, is the example that I'm using now. They have the San Francisco standard. And then depending on how the living cost compares to San Francisco, so does the salary and so on and so forth. Uh, 
I mean, and their argument is exactly this. I mean, if we all start competing uh, uh, for the top, we will generate a big problem uh, in uh, in some countries. At the same time, we have the other ar argument that this would give a meetup by itself. Maybe it's an idea for the future, which is so two people doing the same tasks, same job, are paid differently. Are we okay with this? Uh, uh, with this reality. So I think you have, uh, you'll find advocates for both, uh, for both schools of thought, if we can call them that. Yes, I, I think that what we felt is along the, <laughs> the same lines as what, what Peter was saying. Uh, and, and let me just add, because, because I, I, I may interpret, I, maybe I, I have the wrong interpretation, but I, felt like the the question from the chat was also about uh, foreign people coming to Portugal to 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 work uh, and 2020 was not an easy year in terms of relocation not only in Portugal but also in other locations we were actually hiring people with the plan of moving them to different country and couldn't get them the visa and to have them start working we had to get the help from an external company or we had to make the decision that you know you are going to start working for us in the Netherlands and you are going to stay there uh, until this madness settles and when things are good we are going to relocate you to to Portugal uh, so we didn't uh, maybe not yet um, feel felt a big pressure from foreigners in Portugal uh, looking for work and driving the salaries up. But he, he, from our experience, it was not a good year to move people uh, between countries and even for people that were on assignments with the company, we had lots of challenges because of visas. Yeah, sorry guys, I didn't I didn't had to quite understand the full question here, but yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, I think both interpretations are, are equally valid. So Stella, did you have the next question? Yes. Um, so uh, Inesh was asking that um, boot camps were made with aim of putting in the market more tech people in less time um, to suppress the lack of professionals in the field. Um, however, she's saying that after the bootcamp, almost no one gets hired. And the reason is we don't need juniors developers at this moment. Um, what are your thoughts in this? Um... Uh, I, I can start on this one. Uh, we actually have partnerships with uh, Iron Egg, Little Vago, and a lot of bootcamps. And we really believe on the relevance exactly for what Inez was saying. I mean, we have a talent a shortage. Bootcamps are uh, doing their role and uh, an amazing role in shortening uh, that that talent shortage. If I may, um, I think, of course, companies are sometimes it's a matter of stack. I mean, these boot camps are very centered around a certain uh, technology. Of course, there is a number of uh, technologies taught as they, they should, uh, but sometimes there is simple simply no fit. Right? I mean, sometimes. You are applying for a job, uh, uh, even though you know, yes, Ruby on Rails and uh, React and Node. I mean, maybe that company is PHP. And so, I mean, those cases, I think that those are not the cases that Inez is uh, concerned about. Uh, as for the other companies, I think companies are really some, somehow short-sighted on this. And uh, they prefer to have a position open for four months before they, they find someone who can be uh, a fit than to find someone who has a really great drive. I mean, if there's something that characterizes generally, broadly speaking, of course, uh, bootcamp graduates is they, they took the step to change careers and they are very motivated to start. And so uh, this is something that when it comes to the learning curve is a very good proxy. I mean, someone who graduated from a bootcamp in uh, nine, it depends, right? Nine weeks, uh, 12 weeks, six weeks, you have, you have them all. But people who learn this and uh, who are now in the market, they have the capacity to learn. And so I think this is slowly 
uh, at the moment, uh, you would expect companies to to be more uh, open to these sort of profiles. Uh, but in fact, I, I agree with Inez, it's not a, a trend that, that we're seeing. I don't believe that boot camps are, do not have value. I believe that definitely there's a lot of work to be made from players like Landing Jobs, and we have been on this fight, and also the, the companies organizing the boot camps in uh, demystifying, demystifying and uh, ghost myth busting to some extent. Uh, around uh, boot camps because there's also a lot of uh, bad rep uh, uh, in the market. If I could give an advice, uh, if I may, I would stick to something that, do something that you're passionate about. It does, well, if you believe that it's going to something that's going to disappear or have less attention, Try to adapt that, that passion to something that's in need with the market. Try to figure out and adapt, as a, I, I guess Melissa was saying earlier, try to adapt what the market or the, 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 the current um, needs in terms of, uh, of business needs. That maybe can be um, a way out or a, a, a way to raise here uh, an opportunity. I agree with you, Gabrielle, and I think that's a, a really good point. And um, especially with people that were coming from other areas that decide to take boot camps, um, you see some people that uh, th their motivation is they, they really want to make a career change and do something a bit more stable, but their passion is somewhere else. Uh, and when you are talking with them and they're just saying, I decided to do this because I couldn't find a job, you're going to think, mm, you don't really like this, you're not going to be happy doing this. But a lot of people are actually interested in this. And some of the people that you talk with, they say, uh, look, I did the boot camp, but I also did an online course on JavaScript on my own. Uh, I tried to learn programming on my own. And that's where you see, OK, so they like this and they are serious about this. And this makes this makes a lot of difference, a lot of difference. Yeah, yeah, I, I would I would like to say as well, um, I run also a boutique um, recruitment agency for diverse talent in tech. And so one of the things that I would like to, to recommend to the people that finish it, um, boot camps is that go online and participate on open source projects. I think this is one of the, the things we really look at. Personally, I don't know if the, if the rest uh, you will agree, but um, how, how much involved you are in open source for us, is a big indicator. And this is challenging, right? Because um, we also kind of expect developers to be obsessed with this and just do this all the time when, when we don't expect that from other professions. So this is also, um, but it's not about doing all of this and being obsessed, obsessed with it. It's just, if you are a junior, they are really good way to learn and to get feedback is to participate in open source. So. In my, in my opinion, and based on my, on my personal experience, I would totally recommend you to get involved. Like right now, blockchain projects, uh, DeFi is on fire. Um, if you go, there are a lot of DAOs, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations where you can contribute and then they will assign, like the community will vote and give you a salary based on your contributions. There is Ethereum Foundation. There is so much out there. Um, so don't only look for the corporate roles. Like be a bit more, uh, challenge yourself, you know, go out of the box and, and try all of these new technologies. Because like I said, these, these organizations are not corporate. Their, their structure is totally different. It might take a bit of time to learn, but I think in my opinion, if I will be on your position, just coming out of a bootcamp, I will totally go for that. I work on that um, uh, sphere before um, and, and it's really, really exciting, so. And now, Michaela, you wanna go ahead with? There is there is actually another question um, that I could nicely connect to the discussion around career change. Um, you were all talking in the beginning about um, you know an increase in in opportunities in in tech fields, um, and would this increase 
um, open up more opportunities for people who are, say, older than uh, 45 years old who are making a career change and now just starting in, in tech um, careers? And that's a question coming from Carmen, actually. Who wants to, to go ahead? Anybody have any experience? That's that's a, that's a very relevant question. I have to admit that we don't that we don't have a lot of experience with that. Uh, to to be to be honest, the the career changes that I've seen in the market were coming from from people that were a bit younger. So uh, I'm not sure if I would be the best person to advise here. I would say that it's definitely possible to do a career change at any period in life. It may be a bit more difficult because you are coming from, uh, you basically have an entire career doing something else and making the change and, and having prospective employers see you willing to do the change would probably take a bit more effort, but I, I don't have um, hands-on experience with this, so I'm just not, not talking from factual experience. Um, I could say my uh, experience, which I had in practical terms, it's more of uh, cultural. Um, for example, I had, I had a, a project in the Netherlands where it's, it's totally normal to have older people working with um, with the technology, with the emerging technology, doesn't matter. So I guess it's a matter of culture, first of all. Um, second of all, I think it's much of what uh, Pedro was saying to actually be a fit to the role, to actually uh, engage with that role uh, effectively. So it's a combination of of, of both of these, uh, but I think uh, I think we're we're going to. I think no, it's it's absolute. We're going to through some serious cultural transformation. So, uh, in a positive way, I think there's more diversity and um, and uh, yeah, this this more open to diversity and inclusion. That was the word. So I guess we're more open to that in a global scale. Gabriela, can I just ask a follow up to that? I think. Yep. Um, what you had said earlier, you had said earlier about diversity and inclusion, and then I, I yeah. thought to myself, um, with this transfer to remote, uh, I can imagine that if I'd already had a 30 year career where I was going to the office every day, the sudden switch to sitting at my computer at home trying to connect with people. And so, you know, yeah. that diversity and that change in, in culture also has to be about how we accommodate uh, different cultures within our culture, right? Um, so having come from a very strong office culture, how do we help people make that transition? Um, mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to add that, that it's, you know, I think a lot when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're thinking about uh, sex or race or um, orientation, but age is a big one as well, particularly in tech. And, um, and I think it's just one that we need to consider. Plus, I would say 45 is the new 35. So, <laughs> you know, thank you to the original question asker, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, Stella, Michaela, back to you. Uh, Stella, do we have time for one more question or? Yes, if you want to go ahead and ask the last one and I'll, I'll share the results of the poll as well. But we have 28% okay. of people actively looking for a job, 43% not actively, but looking open to opportunities. And I'll launch a new poll while you finish. Okay. Um, so um, one question from Carla, um, who is asking whether the recruiting process will become more demanding from now on, and whether it will become more demanding for junior positions. Um, I will just quickly say what we just spoke. Uh, um, um, previously. Uh, it's all about uh, niche specialization with, I really believe, uh, we in consultancy, when we are looking for people, we, we are looking for specialization. For, let's say a machine learning engineer, um, even, even, even a software development, a, a .NET developer, something that uh, is more specific. Uh, yeah, 
so again, try to find your passion and combine it with opportunities that are available. And yes, it will be more specific related, I guess so. Uh, on now on our side here at Out Systems, um, I I haven't actually felt that the recruitment process is becoming more difficult or more demanding. I feel that that we've been applying the the same levels of difficulty. We do have different levels of difficulty depending on the seniority that we expect from the person, uh, and. Uh, what kind of work do we internally need that person to do? Uh, and so for some roles, we are very much willing to hire someone that has a bit of gaps and we, because we have someone internally that will be able to fill those gaps. For other roles, you need someone very senior and very able to work autonomously. And in some cases, even able to coach and mentor a team. And so for those recruitment processes, we are going to be always more demanding. Uh, and, and then something that we also do is, let's say that we are hiring uh, only, uh, we only have two open roles for, for one position. Um, and it's a skill that is uh, more frequent in the market. So we are going to be a bit more demanding with that recruitment process. So basically, there are lots of things here that are driving how demanding the recruitment process is. And with, with, with us, at, at least, you can find different levels of difficulty for different recruitment processes, but it, it's not becoming harder because of the pandemic situation. Uh, as for the last question, and just to finish, I agree with both Gabrielle and Melissa. I don't think that um, your your job seniority, and this is often something that uh, is not easy to, to understand, uh, is the seniority that you have on that role. So uh, if uh, you have 45 or 35 uh, and you have just started uh, taking uh, learning how to code, you will be treated, you will be put in the same pool as uh, the the people who are 22s or whatever. Uh, and I think you are bringing something new to the table, which is your experience. I mean, I have had in the past year someone way older than the rest of the team uh, uh, in my team. And it's actually great to see sometimes when uh, the younger people, who, where I include myself, we, we, we tend to to, oh, this is such a tragedy, et cetera. And someone with more experience can just say, hey, uh, chill, really. This is, uh, uh, I've been, I've worked here, I've had this experience. And so there's definitely ways in you in which you can add to the table. And I think you should try to capitalize on those. Is junior recruitment more demanding? Uh, well, demanding depends on supply and demand, right? Of course, uh, if companies get a lot of applications in the funnel, uh, eventually someone who will be hired, uh, if he or she is the only in the, in the funnel, will not be hired because there's a more qualified candidate. But this does not mean that the quality, and now you say, okay, so now we don't have a lot of uh, candidates in the market, so it will be easier. Also, no, uh, I think companies, and thankfully, uh, they do not uh, uh, jeopardize their, their recruitment because, I mean, the cost of a mistake in recruitment is uh, really, uh, really severe. Uh, both the direct costs, which means, okay, uh, <laughs> they need to pay your severance, etc., and uh, indirect costs even more which is now I have to spend two months without this position filled and I have to find someone else. So I think in terms of level of quality, of quality, not, not quality, filter of recruitment, uh, I, I don't think we should expect any changes for junior, for senior, for, for mid positions. What changes is the, the amount of talent in the market. And maybe if I feel the job requirements and do not feel the nice to haves, uh, I will be recruited if there's no one else. If there's someone else competing with me and he or she has the, the, all the nice to apps, then I will not be selected. This does not mean that the, 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 the process is more demanding. It means that the market is uh, hotter, if you allow me. 
Thank you, Pedro. Go ahead, Gabriela. I was just going to add, uh, and if you are junior or if you're a recent um, professional within the, the, the a specific um, field or, or whatever, uh, what is really good, and you need this uh, information of, a, of, of the market or of this uh, field, it's good. Um, I connect here with the, the idea of the speech of Stella of actually getting engaged here with open source communities and actually getting involved. So this is a healthy thing, uh, even professionally and socially, it's, it's really good and can be an advantage. Great. Thank you. Uh, we are four minutes over. And so I just wanted to thank our panelists and hand it over to Stella to close us out. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. So most of you think this is going to stay. Um, let's see, right? <laughs> Next year, we get together and we, we see this. I would like to thank you all very much, uh, Loren, Gabriela, Pedro, Melissa, uh, for being here today, for sharing your insights. Everyone else um, that has been very active in the chat, sorry we couldn't take all your questions, um, but feel free to, to follow the conversation. We have um, a LinkedIn group. We also have a Facebook group. I'll share the links in the chat but anyway we will send them also on a follow-up uh, on eventbrite so everyone who registered an eventbrite you will get the links and also i would like to let you know that we are preparing an event for next month for uh, international women's day called choose to choose to challenge bias at work um, with lean in portugal so we are also going to discuss um ways that all of us can challenge those biases that we find at work. And we are gonna discuss some research-based strategies to deal with that. So I invite everyone also to join us. I'll keep, I'll, I'll leave the link here. Also on our event, right? There are the links to, to the ways you can continue the conversation online. And yeah, anything else, Michaela, you wanna add? Uh, nothing from my side, just for whoever hasn't joined us on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook yet, go ahead and do it. Uh, we will be sharing a lot of um, interesting events uh, upcoming, so keep in touch there. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.